All right, welcome back for another edition of the Musician Beat, our interview series with Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony musicians who are currently at home or um, at somebody else's home where they're safe and um, staying safe while we work our way through this pandemic and look forward to getting back together to make music again. And we want to welcome our wonderful principal flutist, the always vivacious Claudia Anderson. Claudia, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Jason. It's great to be here. So um, for those folks who may not know you very well, why don't you just give us a quick you know, background sketch in terms of your general background and kind of how you wound up in the symphony too. Well, sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, my, my own um, upbringing and early life in music was pretty standard for, uh, in some ways, first year in band, so on and so on and all that stuff. However, I always kind of looked for ways the flute was could do stuff that it wasn't supposed to. I, I looked for kind of out there music. And so I always had this idea that the flute should do more than traditionally it did. And I loved a lot of different instruments and sounds. I didn't particularly love the flute. I came to love it, but it was kind of my vehicle for expression. So that's sort of where I started and ended up going to University of Michigan, where I became resident flutist in their new music ensemble, became more comfortable, of course, at that point with new music. On the strength of that, I think I got a Fulbright to Italy to study with Severino Gazzaloni, who was the foremost um, flutist at the time of, of new music, avant-garde. There were all the famous composers of the day, including Luciano Berrio, wrote for him. And so um, I did study with Gazzaloni and I did study Berrio, but, I also studied Schubert and Vivaldi and Mozart, and <clears throat> it was like this amazing discovery of, of the colors and the possibilities playing both old and new music, which was not done that way in this country at the time. It was like traditional stuff and weird stuff, and the two kind of didn't meet. And um, so that was a huge gift for me. And, and, and while I was in Italy, I, I ended up um, becoming a principal flute in one of the major opera orchestras of Italy. And, and so when I came back to the States seven years later, there was this unusual combination of opera, new music, both of those really incorporate theater, um, this idea of old and new repertoire that are, were, were equal and not separate. And I took all of that into my own teaching and playing <clears throat> from there on. And I think um, the uh, I've done solo work, I do a lot of different chamber music. I have a professional flute duo, um, <clears throat> so a lot. and um, I've always had the thread of orchestra from the beginning. Um, and partly, I think uh, my sense of all of color, you know, as I was saying earlier, that it's not just flute, because I didn't care so much about flute. It's one thing, it's one instrument. And uh, I've tried to put as many colors <laughs> into that as I could, but being in the middle of all the orchestral colors has always been just you know a thrill and um i don't know i've i've, I've had i've had a long history i think with the symphony and, and um on and off i i was a guest a number of times with different conductors you know before you and um but i think um solidifying my position you know <clears throat> after you arrived was um has been one of the really wonderful threads in in my professional life and um, I've always appreciated your um, creativity and, and daring sometimes in programming. I think it's been fantastic what you have given to the audience as well as to us. And um, so it's just been another layer in my, you know, musical life of real <laughs> enrichment. Amazing musical life. And, you know, as I've been going through older performances, putting together the whole series of archive shows that we're doing, it's been such a joy to hear you play those solos, you know, go back eight or 10 years and hear some wonderful work. So we've, we've really benefited from, from having you in the orchestra so much. You can hear that in the recordings, but we're not the only ones. You, you also are quite active teaching. Tell us just a little bit about the teaching that you do. Okay. Well, I, I do. I teach at Grinnell College. I've been there for some time now. Um, I, I, in, um, when we were allowed to travel and move around, I, I had summer festivals that I worked in, uh, one in Colorado, Rocky Ridge Music Center, one in Idaho. Um, I've, I've done master classes all over, um, toured um, a lot with my partner, Jill um, Azawa, uh, one of the last live concerts we did before this was in early March in Philadelphia. And um, I, this maybe can bring in 
uh, some of my activity in, in commissioning works. And um, we, Jill and I commissioned uh, this work called Winds for Change, um, Meditation on Climate Change, and have toured quite a bit with that. Um, and uh, the, I guess that then kind of leads to my most recent project, um, which is called Glass Ceilings, where I was able to capture four really remarkable women to write short pieces for me. Um, and um, this is in progress right now. One is a jazz player. Uh, uh, one is part of the, the uh, duo called Flutronics in New York area. There's an urban pop style that they have used among many others, minimalist. Um, uh, another one who's done a lot with um, very social, socially conscious works inspired. Um, and um, each person has a very different composing style. I got thrown into the mix as well, and I've started working with electronics and and uh, trying to do my own soundtrack. So part of this is, of course, terrifying <laughs> from my own standpoint. But I think having um, one of the one of the few things I can say about you know our, our enforced isolation is that we all do have time. We have more time to reflect. We have we have enforced time to to you know concentrate more on some of the stuff that we wouldn't be doing at the the level that at least i uh, am fighting myself right now and being able to reflect a little more on <clears throat> some of these areas that um uh, before were maybe more not marginal but more to the side of my regular activities um i have to say it's been really um, rewarding in a lot of ways. And the other part of that is that I think what we're doing right now through Zoom and offering, you know, our audiences, symphony audiences, more insight into each of us, it's the same thing that has happened with my, um, in particular, this Glassy Links group. We've had these Zoom meetings that have been, you know, because we started out really not knowing each other very well. So that never would have happened, you know, without this kind of, you know, demand on, on each of us that we we be somehow more disciplined where we are and try to figure out our way through all this. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And, and there's always opportunity and challenge. I mean, that's something that we, we always try to look at here at the symphony too. So I think it's wonderful to see more and more of us embracing that. But by the same token, I think sometimes the general public doesn't quite have a full understanding of just how difficult it is right now for artists and how unlikely it is that normal arts performances we so-called normal you know kind of the sort of activities we did before the onset of the pandemic that the likelihood of those returning here anytime in the next year in a normal way is is very low so so speak on that for a minute just just kind of emotionally and generally like as you've approached that you know has has it all been you know um able to shift over into to glass ceilings and these other projects or do you feel like there's a part of you that's still kind of left out there, you know, sort of waiting for its love when, when we can finally try to get back to a more, at least normal type of live performance. Yeah, I, I cannot imagine there would be a single person in our symphony, for one, who would not say we are, we feel a huge loss in our own ability to make that kind of music. There's no substitute. We can't do it virtually. We can't, you know, create uh, 60, 70 piece orchestra online and do real meaningful repertoire. Um, and uh, I think that um, the, the other things that we do are, are um, can't be a substitute for this. I think that um, uh, in future, we, we don't know exactly. Everyone's, everyone's working so hard to try and figure out <laughs> what that future can be. Mm -hmm. We can do certain things with smaller groups. Um, uh, I might have mentioned this to you when we talked um, the other day about flute, which is the worst offender because <laughs> our air goes right out to everybody. We're so generous. And um, so, but there's there's a, a device that was invented actually for, for marching bands for, <laughs> for the flutes to to be able to, to channel their air, to actually be heard on like outside sure. and on the field that um, I, I am 
trying out right now and, and would think about getting for my students. And it would be something, for instance, that could be a possibility in, in an orchestra setting, you know. Um, it, having to think in that, that way, it's, you know, it seems um, difficult. Uh, I think we have a chance for um, uh, trying to look at a plus a bit of, of doing um, arrangements, physical spatial arrangements that could be, you know, we've done in the past anyway with smaller groups. Well, you know, we we, we could try to do that and, and take advantage of it. Um, I don't know, um, you know, I don't know what our audiences have said, you know, in, in surveys yet, in, and maybe you can um, speak to that, but um, uh, how they feel about, you know, the this particular moment and the loss of live music. Yeah, I would say I would say audiences are also feeling it, and that's what we have heard so far as well. And yet, like many of us who are performers, audiences are also nervous about gathering in large groups. So there's the there's the twin kind of, or or I guess the two sides of the coin, and one is which you know everybody's really feeling emotionally the loss, but also feeling the sense of caution and the sense of the need to proceed very carefully, uh, because I think everybody agrees that the worst thing would be for us to do something rash and premature that could cause potentially further problems. We just don't want to go there. So it's a very delicate balance that I think, every, like you said, everybody is trying to find the right way through. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I think it would be um, interesting. I'm sure everyone has ideas, including audience members. And I th think you maybe refer to having a dialogue with between audience and musicians, which would be nice actually in the Zoom format. I, I think that maybe having, you know, a group um, from, from each side could be nice. And this is where I think Zoom actually works quite well. Um, and, you know, maybe we could get some, some more sense of maybe what we could do. But um, I see, because I'm sort of the, the rebel and like doing what you're not supposed to do, as I was saying earlier, <laughs> musically, I love the idea of just, really trying out some unusual, you know, ways of performing for fewer people, maybe, yes, but, you know, we can't. Social distancing doesn't mean, actually, <laughs> that we can't be in the same space. We can. We just have to figure out, you know, how to, how to do that, and I think, I think if we can go with that, that's what I would like to go with, with that assumption, that hope that, that actually we can be in you know, a common space and make music, you know, however different it would be. But yeah. I think there's no question that we all want to get back to that. In some yeah, way. I agree with you. And I, I think, you know, the symphony is, is clearly planning on, on live performances coming and, and we're looking at, you know, the, the possibility that audiences may not be able to join us uh, in person, but that still, we would like to get to some more live programming as soon as possible, including conversations as well as musical um, events. And so, Certainly, that's that's the direction we're heading. We just gotta everybody's gotta keep fingers crossed that we don't wind up going downhill. <laughs> we just keep sort of moving in a positive direction as a society. Hopefully, that will will help make this happen. Um, but but shifting just slightly because we were talking about the symphony and of course everybody's feeling emotionally a little bit of the loss of not having it there. What I'd like to do with these interviews is to kind of flip it a little bit and say, is there is there something about playing the symphony you particularly enjoy or a memory you have, a piece that you just loved playing? Because hearing those stories from you and your colleagues in the orchestra really is a special treat for all of us who usually just listen in silence and hear you play your instruments. Um, well, you know, there, there are really a lot of performances that I, I, I can remember and having the, the you know, the, um, the, the great you know, uh, wonderful uh, ability to play as a soloist, you know, and uh, has has been um, very, um, well, you know, you go through everything, you, you feel totally exposed, maybe you have a bad day, you feel vulnerable, it's, oh, no, you know, <laughs> um, and then, of course, it goes, you know, to, to great heights as, as think when things work. And uh, I mean, I, I can certainly remember, um, you know, you mentioned my soul performances. I, I, I do have to say that 
playing uh, Leonard Bernstein's Halil with you and the, and the small orchestra was a real highlight. You know, I think uh, I've always loved Bernstein's music. I was connected to him, you know, personally in my much younger um, professional life. And <clears throat> um, that that's a, that's a performance I'll always remember. I think it, it's a, a remarkable piece. And um, But I, uh, um, just thinking about my, my wind colleagues in particular, um, you know, uh, who are all such wonderful musicians in their own right. We all have very different personalities, um, you know, personally and musically. And of course we work to, to make all that uh, come out together in the section. I, I don't think the audience has any idea really, unless they happen to be, you know, similar types of musicians, what it takes to, to create um, a section, you know, and, and it's, you may think of it as compromise, but it's just adapting your sound, adapting your pitch. Um, so uh, the, the, the one thing that I, I maybe can relate <laughs> that might be, I don't know, but, I, but I've always remembered it. Um, when I first kind of joined the symphony officially, um, this, I believe Jack Graham was still principal clarinet. And um, Eric Walkman, who is now our principal, was playing second. And either, I, is this true? Were you, was, was Jack principal when, when you started? I can't remember what his status was, but he played a couple, at least a couple times in principal when, so I, when I was, was guess, yeah. Maybe he was a guest principal. Anyway, so, <laughs> so you know, um, I mean, Jack and I do each other and then, uh, somewhat. And so, so we're warming up and... And I hear Jack just, I mean, it just sort of over the whole orchestra. It's <laughs> so loud. So I turned around and I said, that is the loudest clarinet playing I've ever heard. And, you know, he knew that, like he and I were, it was sort of, you know, sort of half in jest. But I saw, but I noticed Eric out of the corner of my eye. And he was like, his eyes open and he looked like, what? What did this person just say? And I didn't know Eric at all. And uh, so anyway, it's like, you know, that's over. But it, I, I realized that it was a long time before Eric actually spoke to me. <laughs> and then when we finally had a conversation, he said, I just, I, I, I just didn't know what to do when you said that about Jack. And, and I was, I was just, I was like, well, I was scared that he was going to say something. And, and, and I, it's just, and I thought, well, who is this person? So it's just, you know, you you have you have things like this where you're 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 in the middle of making music and you're also trying to assess, especially when you're getting to know, you know, your your colleagues. Like, well, what is this person really like? What do they mean when they say that? What is <laughs> and it's it's funny, we're all making music, but but there's this whole personal layer of things that of course enriches over the years and of course, Eric and I are wonderful colleagues, you know. <laughs> now, but it's a great story. You know, I, I I love I love to hear those names, and, and of course, we've missed Jack a lot. You know, right. he passed away a number of years ago, but he was such a key member of the symphony family, and I'm I'm just so glad that all of us have had this chance to make music together and continue to to do that. I mean, we're going to be doing it here hopefully soon in the fall, and and then once we can return to more normal mode, we'll be doing it again too. And for that, um, you know, I'm super grateful, and I think all of us are. All right, as well. Before before we sign off, though, Claudia, anything else you'd like to share about you know what's going on or what you hope for the future? Anything you want to share out with our patrons before we uh, cut you off and send this one uh, out to be published? Uh, oh man! Um, I know I put you on the spot. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, I, I it's hard to know what else to say right now. I, I think I hope that um, I hope that. I guess all of us, um, musicians, staff, and audience, um, will be and remain engaged in um, our conversations. And maybe this goes to, you know, what's what's happened in our world um, in the last months: pandemic, murder of George Floyd, um, many issues that have come to the surface and become you know, mandatory to be dealt with. I think that the issue of, um, of the future of our musical life um, has been really important anyway. Before COVID, it was a, an urgent issue. We were not all okay, you know, 
classical music in particular has, has had many, many bumps and issues and we're, we, we all the struggle, you know, on some level and you know that with the symphony. So here's an opportunity to take it to a different place because we are, have been forced to, but I think the most important thing right now, frankly, in our community and the world community really is just to stay connected to each other. That's how we're going to do it. You know, we have to. <laughs> yeah, those are great words. I'm so glad you. I'm so glad you shared that with us, and so glad that you joined today for our little musician podcast here. And um, we will be hearing from you again, both uh, via the flute and hopefully, like you said, some conversations with our players, other players, and and patrons coming up soon. So we'll look forward to that. In the meantime, thank you so much, Claudia, for joining us today. My pleasure, Jason. Always. Thank you. You're welcome.